In 2020, 31% of Black or African American players reported being harassed in online games. In 2021, 42% of uh, Black or African American gamers reported being targeted because of their identity in online games. Similarly, uh, Asian American players, 26% were targeted in 2020, and in 2021, 38% were targeted by identity-based hate in online games. I'm Quinta Jurassic, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, November 11th, 2021. Today we're bringing you another episode of Arbiters of Truth, our series on the online information ecosystem. And with the holiday season approaching, we thought we'd take a break from all the bleak content and talk about something fun. Video games. Just kidding. Content moderation in video games turns out to be just as much of a bummer as content moderation everywhere else. Perhaps even more so. Evelyn Dueck and I spoke with Daniel Kelly, the Director of Strategy and Operations for the Anti-Defamation League's Center for Technology and Society. He studies how companies deal with the many moderation issues that pop up in gaming, from harassment to digital recreations of violent hate crimes and white nationalist propaganda. And his team at the Anti-Defamation League has a new report out on how players experience abuse, but also joy and connection while gaming. We asked Daniel to make the case for us about why everyone, gamers and non-gamers alike, should care about games, why harassment in gaming seems particularly bad compared to non-gaming platforms, and where the gaming industry stands when it comes to investing in content moderation. It's the Lawfare Podcast, November 11th. Video games cannot escape the content moderation reckoning. The topic of our conversation today is content moderation in games and gaming, and I think it's a pretty excellent demonstration of my thesis-catchphrase that everything is a content moderation issue. But I think it's also fair to say that in the Venn diagram of Lawfare podcast audience members and the core gaming demographic, there's a little bit of overlap, but but maybe not a heap. So maybe we can start with an intentionally provocative question, which is, why should people who are interested in content moderation and the health of the internet environment, which is the topic of this podcast, uh, care about video games? Isn't this just a kid's issue? Sure. So I can I can answer that. And I've heard that question before. So the games industry as a whole is larger than the film and the music industry combined. If you look at the, the latest sort of statistics from the Entertainment Software Association in the United States, there are over 200 million gamers in the U.S. Uh, and the majority of them are actually between 18 and 64. So actually the AARP put out a really great study on older gamers recently, which is worth looking at. But essentially this is uh, one of the most dominant media of our time. It is played by people the world over and it is played by adults. This is not just a kid's space. Uh, And so I think it it is imperative that folks who are interested in content moderation become interested in in video games because every online game that exists right is an online platform right fortnite is an online platform league of legends is an online platform all of these are places where people gather and talk to one another and have communications play games together but also talk about other things so I think it is uh, imperative. I think the, the the comparison that I that I give often is, you know, in 2006 when Facebook first went on beyond colleges. I don't know if we imagined that, you know, the outcome of elections would be, you know, predicated in that space, or that it would become implicated in genocides across the world. So we have to think ten years from now. What will video games and online games as social spaces become? And if when we think about them, content moderation in video games in those terms, I think it becomes really clear how important uh, it is to to address that. To give our listeners an idea of the kind of issues that we're going to be talking about today and why they matter, I thought it might be helpful to start by asking you about Roblox and why it's having content moderation issues. And before anyone dismisses this as a non-issue, I want to note just that Roblox has a just an astonishing usership. It has more than 43 million players every day, and over 50% of them are under age 13. So first off, just what is this game that is so popular, and uh, what are the content moderation issues that crop up in it? So it's interesting. Uh, so Roblox is 
somewhere in between a video game and a sort of social platform and like a game library, right? So Roblox is a platform where players can, of, of many ages, many very young, can create various sort of game environments using a series of of different sort of library assets, right? They can create the cowboy game. You can create a space game. You can create any kind of game. And the game that, that you know, keeps popping up when I go to look for different examples of heinous things uh, is, you know, a, a bunch of folks, and they've, you know, addressed this to some extent, but, you know, a bunch of folks have created, for instance, the Christchurch Mosque uh, Massacre, from 2019 and, and sort of recreated it in Roblox. We've also found uh, people creating, you know, anti-Semitic synagogues where there is like a 20 foot tall uh, glass of, of juice with a, a Jewish star in it, right? Uh, the Holocaust didn't happen on a synagogue written in it. So, so Roblox clearly has content moderation issues, but I think it also suffers from an issue of discoverability you can't search Fortnite for what people have created. You can't search League of Legends for for conversations. You can search Roblox for, for instance, Christchurch recreations. The other day when Kyle Rittenhouse, the Kenosha shooter, was in the news, I looked up and found various avatars which lets you play as Kyle. So you can look up these things on Roblox. So I don't know specifically if Roblox is worse than other game platforms, but it definitely allows for discoverability in a way that other game platforms don't. And so you can more easily see the content moderation issues. And just to be clear, is this a situation where if you weren't looking for it, you could stumble across it in kind of the virtual space? Or is it something that you would need to be seeking out? So, you know, it's unclear to me the degree to which certain experiences are recommended, like a YouTube you know, videos recommended, but certainly if you're, you know, looking for uh, something to do with Christchurch, right? Or if you are, you know, a kid who's come home from Hebrew school and are interested to see, okay, I love Roblox. What uh, what does the synagogue look like in in Roblox? Uh, so you could ostensibly stumble into one of these spaces because you're looking for a related term. Right, and then you you end up in a in a space that is one of these hateful recreations or uses of Roblox to spread hate. It's it's certainly possible. Okay, so I don't want this podcast to be misunderstood as a podcast that is in the tradition of you know moral panics over video games. Sure. Um, I personally love gaming. I haven't had as much time to do it uh, recently as I would like. I think Civ Four is about where I tapped out. <laughs> but, you know, this this podcast may convince me that I need to get back into it just yeah. uh, <clears throat> you know purely for research purposes. So I you know I want to ask you a little bit to talk about the the positive experiences and the positive aspects of the social side of gaming before we you know um, yeah. dig in more. To some of the less positive side. So, you know, why shouldn't we just ban gaming altogether like the Chinese government is moving towards? No, this is a good question, right? No, I'm, I'm in a similar space. I'm a gamer. I was raised gaming. And so the reason that I, I do this work, and I think that folks in this space who care about these issues do work on, on making games a more respectful, and inclusive space for all people is essentially that the you know, games are an important are important medium and important social space. And, you know, ADL has run a survey for the last three years that sort of has looked at hate and harassment and various heinous things in online games, but also has made a point to focus on positive social experiences because the reason why we want to make sure that games fight hate and harassment and address these kinds of things is because positive social experiences are so powerful in these spaces. So if you look at among adults, we had in 2021, 99% of our of our respondents in our survey said that they had some positive social experiences in online games. 92% said they helped other players. 89% said they made friends. 87% said they felt they belonged to a community. People discover new interests. They learn about interesting topics. They learn about themselves and others. They find a, a partner, right? Which, you know, is the limits of surveys, right? 64% they found a partner. Is that a gaming partner? Is that a life partner, right? There was a there was a modern love piece in the Times uh, over the summer that was about how a couple found love and got married because they met inside of a game. So, you know, the, the, the experiences that people have in these spaces are powerful and are real. And the, the 
reason we fight hate and harassment and, and push against extremism in these spaces is because they are important spaces and they should be uh, available and, and welcoming and, and these kinds of experiences should be, should be had by, by all people. And further to that, you know, it's not just fun and social experiences or meeting partners of whatever variety. You know, I think that there's sometimes people can overlook the diversity of experiences mm-hmm. that can take place on gaming platforms. So, you know, from the report that you just mentioned, the Anti-Defamation League, you know, players of Animal Crossing participated in Black Lives Matter vigils, mm-hmm. rallies supporting protesters in Hong Kong, which led to the Chinese government banning the game. Um, one of my personal favorites is that on Minecraft, Reporters Without Borders have created an uncensored library that houses a virtual collection of otherwise inaccessible journalism from all over the world um, so that people in countries with repressive governments can read censored material. So Jamal Khashoggi's articles are available in Saudi Arabia, for example. Um, so, you know, games can be a site of political expression as well as just, you know, fun and, and competitiveness. So I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. How, how common is that with those sort of exceptions or is there a lot of sort of political conversation going on is this where kids do politics for example sure so i don't think we know yet right i i don't think that there is uh, a real sense of the the scope of that you know i will you know i think the example that you give you give the both of those examples are are, are great ones um more recently with the uh, the series of lawsuits for blizzard the video game company blizzard that makes world of warcraft and overwatch and a few others Players, you know, so there was a series of lawsuits about harassment in the workplace. And so players took to the game World of Warcraft to do sit-in protests about sort of gender-based harassment in the gaming industry and the specific sort of issues with Blizzard. And so you see, you know, a variety of of folks doing political activity, both, you know, involving the games itself, but also in involving the sort of the broader world. And, you know, I think we saw uh, a bit more of that during the pandemic when in-person organizing was uh, less encouraged or, or, or less safe, but we do continue to see it. All right. So then let's talk about some of the, the less pleasant sides, uh, which I think is definitely a part of why we called you here today. We, we always want to, you know, get some depressing content and we can't have too much pleasant stuff. So what are the more common content moderation issues that crop up? on gaming platforms. You've done these really impressive surveys over a number of years now at ADL that sort of set out the problems that gamers run into. What are the main issues that they report? Sure. So our our survey looks at hate uh, harassment in, in online games. And we found over the last three years that we've seen an increase from 74% of gamers reporting harassment in 2019 to 83% of gamers. Uh, these are adults 18 to 45 saying that they are experiencing harassment. And so within that, we have uh, a, a similar increase in severe harassment. So when we're talking about severe harassment, we're talking about s- discrimination based on identity, physical threats, sustained harassment, stalking, sexual harassment, doxing and swatting. And so we're so we're talking about a, a cross section of really severe and uh, and harmful experiences that players have across the spectrum and you know i think the the amount that we see this is is you know is startling and is shocking i think in the past year particularly we've seen it's it's been notable that um we've we did some collecting of of statements made by the game industry supporting black lives matter supporting uh stop asian hate in light of various violence against uh, Black Americans and Asian Americans. And in the same time that the game industry has been talking about issues affecting those communities, there's been a double-digit increase, according to our survey, in harassment targeted specifically at these identities. So in 2020, 31% of Black or African American players reported being harassed in online games. In 2021, 42% of uh, Black or African American gamers reported being targeted because of their identity in online games. Similarly, uh, Asian American players, 26% were targeted in 2020. And in 2021, 38% were targeted by identity-based hate in online games. So what I generally say uh, is any sort of phenomena of hate and harassment and extremism that you think about or, or see in social media, you can see similar phenomena in, in online games. We also asked about people's experience with extremism and extremist ideologies. And uh, in 2021, 
almost one in 10, 8% of our survey respondents were exposed to white supremacist ideology. So this is sort of the extremist variety of, of white supremacy, right? Not the sort of structural. This is um, people who say things like, who talk about the superiority of whites and the inferiority of non-whites, a home for the white race, these kinds of things. All of these things which we're f- familiar with talking or hearing about in social media, these same kinds of phenomena are present and, and discussed and experienced in online game environments, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I will confess here that I am not a gamer, but um, in preparation for this podcast, I spoke to several friends who who are, and one of them who's female um, and has a higher voice said that whenever she plays, you know, Overwatch or Fortnite, she never turns on her mic because as soon as people hear a higher voice that reads as female, they just immediately start, you know, asking for explicit photographs and throwing out misogynistic slurs. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's 100%, you know, uh, not an uncommon story among people who are gamers, especially I think what we saw in the last year with various platforms introducing audio as a form of content, right? Starting with Clubhouse, but then going into Twitter spaces and other things like that. This has been a long-standing issue in in online games going back to the the great scholar Kashana Gray has a has a great paper on this from I think 2013 or 2014 talking about voice chat and Xbox Live and I think generally the the advice to people is that they 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 silence themselves in these spaces they turn off their mics because they don't want to be targeted because of their voice and it's you know sometimes people are targeted because of you know who they are or who people assume they are right based on how they talk or the way they talk the pitch of their voice the the ways in which they express themselves so i think the industry still has a long ways to go in terms of addressing uh voice chat moderation and i think that's you know a, a significant area of concern for for a lot of players and you know we look at in the survey we look at the degree to which players are targeted in various sort of communication modes for the last several years yeah we we've seen uh in match voice chat be the sort of dominant mode by which people are are targeted by harassment in games yeah, and I think that the we can maybe talk about this later in the show, but I think that the content moderation issues that are raised by real-time live audio are just incredibly difficult. Before we dive into that, I just wanted to ask, you know, looking at your reports, I had known that harassment in gaming is unfortunately common, but your report really drives home just how common it is. So this from the 2021 report, uh, you say that 83% of the people who ADL surveyed had been harassed while gaming. 71% had been severely harassed. Uh, I don't have the number for 2021, but in 2020, you reported that 9% of gamers you surveyed called the police because of harassment. I mean, these figures just seem insanely high. And my question to you is, why is that? Is it because video game companies are really bad at content moderation? Is it because, you know, gamers are more likely to be unpleasant people or abusive people are uniquely free to behave poorly? Is this a situation where the figures look uniquely high, but, you know, if you polled users of Twitter or Facebook, the statistics might be similarly bad? Like, what is going on here? This is a good, this is a really good question. I I guess I would say a few things here. So, the the thing that I say in general is that the game industry is about 10 years behind social media in terms of its sophistication with dealing with content moderation. Uh, if you look at some of the categories, you know, I, I, I have a slide which is extremely like helpful on a podcast to be like, I have a slide. Um, but if you compare some of the language in the Twitter or Facebook content moderation guidelines, community guidelines, circa... 10 years ago, they look remarkably similar to the kinds of things you're seeing in online games today. And I think one example I give is this idea that sort of all sort of abusive content is in one bucket, right? And if you look at, you know, Facebook's exhaustive community guidelines, there's like every every kind of, of heinous content is 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 sort of categorized and and put together in in a different category and has different sort of people looking at it or thinking about it and it's true of many platforms for online games i think in general you see less sophistication around classifying different kinds of content and addressing different kinds of harms differently and so 
I think, you know, in part it is that uh, the industry is, I think, catching up, right, with folks like the Fair Play Alliance coming together as a coalition of game companies. There are individuals and and certainly specific companies uh, that are putting resources towards this now. Um, I think what we found was in talking to internal advocates at game companies, having the kinds of numbers that we put together in the survey has been helpful to them as they try to create uh, resourcing for these kinds of initiatives. Because before we really did this, there wasn't any sort of comprehensive understanding, sort of quantitative understanding of the prevalence of these kinds of issues. And so I think that that's been encouraging. I think that's part of it is is the, the game industry not investing uh, as heavily in content moderation, primarily because another thing that's unique about video games and online games is that they are social spaces, yes, but they are also media, right? And the people, you know, game companies, in my experience, the thrust that they had initially and, and the expertise that a lot of game companies have is in creating games as media. And there's less expertise in many game companies in what, so what do we do with this now that this is a social space? How do we create uh, spaces for people to interact in ways that are healthy and that promote sort of respectful interaction and communication? Yeah, there's a whole universe of work to be done around, you know, how does all of the sort of issues that you think about in terms of inclusion in media, right? When you think about a film, whose story is it? Is it what story is being told? Who are the characters? How are they being portrayed? All of that is present in an online game on top of the, all the problems of an online social space, all the content moderation problems that you, that you would, would think was in a space. So speaking of all the content moderation problems that happen uh, in, in social <laughs> spaces, we wouldn't be the Arbiters of Truth podcast if we didn't ask about disinformation. And it's not just hate and harassment in these forums. It seems that disinformation will find a way wherever you let people talk or type, um, there will be disinformation. So can you talk a little bit about what that looks like on gaming platforms? Sure. I mean, we, we've worked a little bit less on uh, disinformation, but I can talk sort of, there are a few different data points. So the last two years, we've, we've asked people in our survey about a couple of different sort of common disinformation tropes, right? Uh, one of which is, should the coronavirus, the COVID-19 be called the Kung flu, Wu flu, Chinese virus, various sort of hateful disinformation about the origins of uh, COVID-19 and 17% of respondents were like, yep, definitely heard heard that in an online game. But in the last three years, uh, the number has fluctuated between sort of 7 and 10% in terms of Holocaust denial. So folks are, are hearing about the Holocaust is, for instance, greatly exaggerated in online games uh, in a certain way. And then this past year, we did ask about uh, some disinformation about the nature of immigrants uh, and the ways in which they're spoken about in these spaces. We asked if folks had heard people talking about the fact that immigrants, the quote fact, right, that immigrants bring crime and or disease into the U.S. And 13 percent of respondents were like, yes, definitely people have have uh, have been talking about that. So, you know, any kind of disinformation, uh, misinformation kind of topic that you might hear in in a social media space is, is likely to is likely to appear in uh, an online game space. But I will say, you know, some of these questions are hard because we have, you know, as, as much as people rail about the transparency of social media companies or lack thereof, there is many times less transparency and less uh, ability to see into game spaces, right? Every social media company has a, a extremely opaque transparency report at this point. There is not one transparency report in the game industry. No one is reporting any statistics at any fr frequency about the nature of various harms or, or good, right, in any online game. So if you ask me about, you know, disinformation within the uh, online game ecosystem, uh, it's, it's really hard to say, you know, writ large. As same thing with hate and harassment, and that's why we, we started doing these surveys, is because there's no reporting, there's no, you know, in the research space, you have a Twitter and a Reddit where there is some data available for researchers to do some 
analysis of what happens in those spaces. There is no online game equivalent to Twitter or Reddit where you're actually able to get data. So the workarounds are, are extremely elaborate around capturing gameplay footage and, and coding it, right? It's There's not a lot that the industry provides to help us understand this. And so there's a lot of work that is put on researchers and civil societies to try to understand these phenomena. That's such a fascinating point, because obviously all the transparency reporting that social media platforms do is entirely voluntary at this stage. You know, the regulators are coming for it. But at the moment, it's just purely as a result of public pressure and and outcry. And even then, it's like very recent. You know, Facebook's community standards only became public in in 2018, which always blows my mind because I feel like I've aged 6,000 years (laughs) since then. Um, But, you know, I guess that it's sort of a product of this fact that, you know, maybe serious people aren't paying attention to gaming platforms quite as much and aren't making the same demands, even though, as we've talked about, millions and millions of people are there and they have all of the same issues. So it's fascinating. Well, I think, you know, I think it's just also the different positioning of social media and the video game industry. Like social media, I feel like wants to get back to like Arab Spring, like we're good societal actors, we are going to save democracy. And so I feel like the voluntary transparency reporting and all these kinds of things are because at one point people were like, oh my God, social media is so great and it's going to give voice to the voiceless and all these kinds of things. Nobody has ever said that video games are going to save democracy. No, Nobody, nobody has ever said that. And so, uh, in fact, you have the opposite. You have everyone in the world blaming various social ills on video games, you know, completely baseless things like video games causing mass shootings and things that are completely disproven in the literature. Uh, and so, but, but as a result, you have the industry in a much more defensive pose than social media, who I think is still trying to, even with everything that's come out, trying to prove that they are good societal actors. Video games is so, the industry is so used to being blamed for everything that they're so defensive that there isn't the same impetus to report out on the nature of games in in the same ways. I wanted to ask about specific kinds of content moderations that you see that are unique to, to gaming. And to kind of frame that question, I want to tell a little bit of an anecdote about another podcast, Reply All, which is a, a show at Gimlet about the internet. And they recently did an episode about the game Team Fortress 2. And the, the premise of the episode is basically that It's one of the host's favorite games, but it's become so choked with bots as to be completely unplayable because essentially as soon as you show up in the game, a bot just shoots you and then the game is over. And a big part of the problem is that the game's developer, Valve, seems to have totally lost interest in maintaining the game. So you have this kind of weird combination of a game that a lot of people still love and play with people messing with the game through bots seemingly just because they can. And then all the players understand that Valve is probably just not going to do anything about this. And I I can't think of an equivalent story in content moderation elsewhere, this sort of situation where the people responsible for governing a platform just bail, but the users are still there. So is that kind of general disruptive behavior as opposed to targeted harassment common in gaming or are there other sorts of disruptive behavior that you'd identify as being content moderation problems well first of all valve is the worst right um they really are uh, (laughs) yeah they run steam which is the largest game platform we did a whole report looking at the ways in which extremists utilize steam and are, are active there and the company does nothing so you know i don't think their uh valve's game Dota 2, Defense of the Ancients 2, has been the most, the games with the most harassment pretty much every year that we've done the survey. So I don't think that they're a great example of content moderation in in online games. Simply, you know, it's like it's like holding up Gab as, you know, the example of what uh, what content moderation is or or should be in in more in more social spaces. But I, I guess I would say that there are unique challenges to content moderation in online games because you're you're operating in a variety of different modes. So one example that I show is um, in a game like Fortnite or even, you know, in the Roblox or Minecraft, you have the ability to create 
whatever sort of structure you want to you want to create inside of the game. So in addition to user generated content being voice, in addition to it being text, it can be sort of structures that exist that you make. So there was there's a picture that I show of um, somebody has used the sort of materials that you can put together in Fortnite and created a giant swastika inside of Fortnite, right? So I, it's unclear to me, you know, there, there are obviously particular affordances to doing some sort of content moderation, moderating or, or, or scanning for these kinds of things, but it's a whole different thing when it is all these kinds of user-generated content that's, that is sort of image or, or sort of interactive object-based. And then you have, you know, the sort of gameplay itself, right? You have uh, people who are not in, you know, using voice or text, but are sort of harassing or, or I've, I've heard certainly anecdotes of people who speak a certain way in a, in a space and the team goes silent and they start throwing the game because they have a woman or a person of color on their team, right? It's a, se- a separate sort of issue of content moderation when people are actually playing the game badly out of disdain for somebody that they're interacting with. So those are, I think, off the top of my head, a couple of, of different examples. Oh, and, and, and there was actually one one other that I would raise, which is there was, in, inside, this is again Fortnite, there was a, a, a sort of a forum on racism that had uh, the, the commenter Van Jones on it. And, and players, you know, had the ability, I forget why exactly, but they had the ability to throw tomatoes. And so they started throwing tomatoes at Van Jones, uh, this commentator. And one of the sort of issues that people had was um, there are certain people who have issues with Van Jones as a as speaking on the the topic of racism, or it could have been racism itself. People hara- throwing tomatoes at Van Jones, but you know that's a sort of very niche description of of uh, of a particular something that's particular to to an online game. What a totally unpredictable outcome where if you give people the affordance to be able to throw tomatoes or tomatoes, as I would call them, that they end up being thrown as a form of harassment. I uh, just could never have seen that coming. That actually segues quite nicely into the question we were sort of alluding to before. You know, all of these different affordances and different ways in which abuse or, you know, content moderation issues can crop up in games means that it's technically a more difficult challenge, right? Like you can moderate text in certain ways. Artificial intelligence tools can be trained on huge databases of text and, you know, use uh, predictive artificial intelligence tools and, and things like that, or hashing tools for matching imagery or videos. Um, but when all of these things are happening in different forms and, and different media formats, it's going to make it particularly difficult. And so I'm wondering how that changes the job of a content moderator on on gaming platforms. Like, does it mean that proactive moderation is much lower and it really relies on community reporting, um, in which case you can see how that might not be the most effective method, given that these probably self-sort into certain communities that aren't going to flag uh, certain content for, for the platform. So I'm wondering how that changes the dynamics of content moderation. Trust and safety is like a column inside of all of these. So like you can have a career in trust and safety at a social media company and it's transferable Twitter to YouTube in some senses, right? There are people who move around in this universe. I think the, the, the approach, the skill set, the, even what the teams are called are different company to company because of this at, at riot games who make league of legends. Uh, the team that deals with a lot of this is called player dynamics, right? Which I think speaks to, the fact that it's not about content moderation as much as it's about how do you create space? What are the dynamics between players? How do you create spaces that encourage better player behavior? And and so I think that's something that's also interesting in games that, you know, the fact that they are, you know, quote, less sophisticated than content moderation at social media, you also have a different skill set of folks who are who are game designers, right? Who are interested in the ways in which people interact and play together. And so I think there is the opportunity for more creativity and more uh, engagement with players beyond the sort of up-down model of content moderation that you see in social media, which is there's more interest in understanding how players play together and how to make that play better. And I think there's also a piece of this is also that the 
online game spaces are much more brittle than social media. Facebook is a monolith. YouTube is a monolith. You have, you know, a, a new platform comes across every few years. But uh, in online games, you know, every six months there's a new online game. And there are some games that have existed for a decade, but only because they've been iterating on what do they need to do to make sure that new players come and, and, and stay in their space. So I think the combination of a different skill set that is focused on the experience of players and the fact that these spaces are more brittle than social media environments, I think creates opportunity for more innovative approaches to the to these problems, uh, even if they don't have the same built out uh, universe of tools and and methods that you see in traditional social media. And so to what extent do the different user bases of different games play into the way that, as you're describing, the sort of particular issues that games companies face in terms of content moderation vary across games? Like, I assume that, you know, the fan base for Call of Duty, which is a first person shooter and ranked very highly in your survey for players who experienced harassment while playing, presumably has a different fan culture and different content moderation problems than the fan base for Animal Crossing, which is a game where you can, you know, build a adorable little village with animal villagers. Although I, I did see on your Twitter feed recently that you can find at least one QAnon design to decorate your home. Yeah, crossing. yeah. So you, it's you, not totally free of problems. Yeah. Now you see what I do in my free time. It's, it's, it's a little, little strange. Anyway, no, um, uh, we've worked with the, an organization called the Fair Play Alliance over the last year, year and change on, on a series of resources that, that look at something like this. I mean, we uh, we believe, and you know, we talk a lot about the ways in which the culture of a company, the culture of a team, are translated or or become part of the game that they're building. We created a, a guide called "Assessing the Behavior Landscape," right? That looks at how do companies and how do teams within companies really crystallize their values in a way that they get manifest in the game spaces they're creating. Because the opposite is also true, right? If you uh, have a toxic work environment, if you if there is harassment in, in the work environment and you aren't being intentional about the culture you're trying to create in these spaces, then you do end up with uh, spaces that have blind spots or that are, are uh, have different cultures. The culture that you are bringing from your workplace uh, will have an impact on the culture that the, the the game you're creating has. I actually want to riff on that idea of different cultures a little bit. One of my favorite go-to examples in content moderation is of Roblox's community standards, um, which we mentioned at the top as a social game platform where you can build your own worlds and, and play other people's games and things. Um, and it's mostly teens and preteens. And their rules are so very different from rules we'd see on other platforms. So for example, they have rules against dating and romantic content, which includes animations of kissing, hand-holding, or other romantic gestures in a romantic context, and experiences that depict romantic events, including weddings, dates, and honeymoons. I mean, they're banned weddings on, on <laughs> Roblox. And they also have a rule prohibiting political content, yeah. which includes any discussions of political candidates. Now, Clearly, those kinds of rules would be absurd on a platform that presents itself as the new public forum, you know, the, the Arab Spring right. style platform. But maybe it's OK on a, on a platform that's oriented around kids gamings. I don't know. So, I mean, I guess the question is, like, how important do you think freedom of expression is in these spaces? So, on the one hand, it seems to me that they're not really supposed to be, you know, the new public forum of deep democratic discourse. Um, like you said, they've never really thought of themselves as the liberators of, you know, the, the going to bring about the Arab Spring in the same way. But on the other hand, we were talking earlier about how political speech does occur in games and that will probably only grow as more people get into gaming and it is where certain people spend most of their time, certain demographics spend most of their time online. And so maybe we should be concerned if platforms who don't see themselves as wanting the headache of having to deal with political content moderation issues or, you know, uh, all romantic content <laughs> moderation issues, heaven forbid, uh, you right. know, weddings on our platform, if they just decide to ban all of this content because they just don't want to have to deal with the controversy that has come to Twitter and, and Facebook and all of our other favorite hits on this podcast, would that be 
a massive loss? I think so. Um, it, you know, it's a, it's a really tough, it's a tough question, right? Because I, I do see this as, as a trend, right? I wrote last year, I wrote a, an a op-ed about all the different ways in which Animal Crossing uh, was being used by political candidates, by AOC, by Joe Biden. And, you know, a week or two later, they were just like, no, no political content, right? We don't want to deal with this this sort of content moderation headache, right? There should be some sort of room, you would think, for diversity of different approaches on content moderation. Like, we don't want the one terms of service to rule them all online in all different spaces. And, you know, it makes sense to me totally that Facebook might want different rules to Roblox or Animal Crossing. But at the same time, it does seem to be this, I seem to be a little, makes me a little uneasy to think that Animal Crossing would just say, we're never letting you discuss politics on our platform. And so I I don't know exactly how to think about that. And I'm wondering how, how you think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think it is a lost opportunity, right? The example that I was thinking of was League of Legends recently announced that in certain types of games between teams of people who didn't know each other, they were going to shut down the chat function uh, after, you know, they've been around for over a decade. They were going to shut down and make it so that, you know, teams can't communicate with one another because their experience has been that the majority of communication that happens between teams of strangers uh, who are you know, combating each other is, you know, uh, hostility, harassment, hate, these kinds of things. And so part of me is like, well, of course, right. You know, if that's your experience, right. If you have the, you know, if you have the data and you're looking at it and you're like, Hey, this communication mode, right. Is particularly heinous. Right. And we can focus on other modes of communication to improve, right? If if they are, you know, used more commonly for for positive engagement, I think on the one hand, you know, you've got to pick your pick your content moderation battles, I, I suppose. But on the other hand, I think there is, it it kind of feels like kicking the can down the road a little bit, right? Because as more people play in these online spaces, as there are more kinds of online spaces you know, there is going to be a Roblox that does allow for political discussion, right? And that platform will have to deal with those problems at that time. So I I think, you know, looking for a solution to creating better, more inclusive, respectful spaces that allow for conversation around topics like politics, that allow for romantic relationships, right? I think there has to be a better solution than just shutting down all engagement around a particular topic and kicking that cannon down the road for another platform at another time who's just starting up to to think through and, and have to deal with uh, from square one because company X would rather just quash those kinds of, of in- engagements. So we would be remiss if we didn't ask you about the, the topic du jour, which is, of course, the metaverse. Uh, and the idea of the metaverse has has gotten a lot of attention in recent weeks, thanks to Facebook or Meta, as I cannot get used to calling it, uh, the announcement that the company is pivoting to this this kind of online experience. But I know I've seen gaming reporters argue that Facebook is actually kind of playing catch up to games like Roblox, where you can dress up your avatar and move it across a, a range of different virtual spaces. So just one observation is honestly, it I, it strikes me as interesting that gaming may actually be ahead here in terms of the possibilities in the metaverse, given that you commented earlier that it is behind in terms of content moderation. It's sort of ahead and behind at once. But I'm, I'm curious, you know, what your research and experience with gaming platforms tells you about the likelihood of content moderations and in, in the virtual world and what those problems will look like. You know, do you, do you have a, a peek into the future for us? Sure. Yes, I absolutely have a peek into the future. It's going to be totally, we're not going to look back on this in a year and be like, yes, he, he totally had it. No, I, um, so I guess a couple of things. So one, I think, I mean, I, I have a hard time taking the metaverse and, and Facebook and meta at, at face value and not seeing it as an opportunity to change the conversation around Facebook and the harms it's caused to society and the ways in which, you know, people on this podcast far, far more expert than I have, have sort of weighed in on relative to that. But um, if we are to take the metaverse at face value for a second, I guess I think of a couple things, right? I think of, 
we put out a report, I think 2018, the, the great researcher, Danya Glabo, did a dive with us around social VR at the time and looked at the ways in which hate and harassment manifest in those spaces, right? And so you can, you have the sort of universal content moderation problems of online games. Social VR is a whole other bucket of, of problems. And I think, you know, any problem that Facebook has in its, its traditional form, it's going to have in its meta form in various spaces. And I think, you know, as our surveys have shown, right, in some senses, right, you have people coming together for like, you know, Ariana Grande did a concert in Fortnite in August, right? And you had people, you know, using the game as a concert venue in ways that felt, you know, that feel super immersive to folks and feel really, you know, like they are part of an, a unique sort of interactive virtual experience, right? But you still have the same issues that are, we've been talking about for this whole podcast about hate and harassment in that game and other games. So I just think any idea that they're going to escape the problems that they've faced by, you know, looking to online games, looking to Roblox, looking to Fortnite, to Animal Crossing, to any of these games is a myth. I think we're, I think this is why, you know, as you said, serious people need to think about the ways in which online games function as social spaces, the ways in which they're behind in terms of addressing the harms that we've seen in social media already, and the ways in which they need to be uh, the focus of scrutiny from researchers, from civil society, from government, to ensure that the kinds of positive experiences we're talking about are possible for all people and that the companies are really pushed to make spaces better for all players. So I want to talk about one of my other favorite topics, which is content moderation as a service. Uh, you were talking earlier before about how one of the reasons maybe gaming is behind in terms of content moderation is, you know, game developers set up a gaming platform and don't really think about or have the skills or want to deal with content moderation issues. And content moderation is hard. Like Facebook and Google uh, with their reams of data and practically infinite resources suck at content moderation. And, you know, they have these armies of content moderators in, in lots of languages, but not nearly all of them, not nearly all of them. Um, and so you can see why if you're a game developer, which just has this like really cool idea for a game, like all of the ones that we've been talking about, you know, Fortnite, Animal Crossing, that you might not be thinking, you know, three steps ahead to what happens when people start exploiting this game for abuse and, and, and other harmful behavior. And so one of the options that game developers might pursue and maybe have been pursuing is hiring third parties to do that for them. And just last month, Microsoft bought one such company called Two Hat, which had developed AI tools to detect things like hate speech and cyberbullying and, and filter it out. And Microsoft's plan is to deploy that on Xbox games. So I'm wondering how broad of a trend this is across the gaming industry. Yeah, I mean, there are a number of yeah, Carlos Figueroa, who is the head of uh, Two Hat, is somebody who was involved in the creation of the framework we work with with the Fair Play Alliance. I would say it's it's an ongoing trend that you see companies like Two Hat, like Spirit AI, like Spectrum AI, a variety of different companies, mo Modulate, right? A bunch of different of these sort of startup companies that are developing ML tools and uh, and techniques and and approaches that are similarly like. It's unclear who these sort of third-party tools and, and companies are accountable to. How do we know that they work? How do we know that they actually make things better? How do we know that? I mean, I think it's, it's, it's laudable that they are, you know, spending time building a business to essentially make these spaces better and more inclusive. But I think we do need more information about how these, get, these companies function, uh, the ways in which they make platforms and game platforms better. And, the degree to which they function. It's another black box that we just don't have answers to, which is, you know, which is, you know, concerning as much as I think the efforts are laudable. So is the reckoning coming for gaming companies? You know, are, are they sort of going to start being more proactive about this? Or or more generally, you know, to, to close out this conversation, what else are you keeping an eye on? What else is flying under the radar? Sure. So I, I would say that in the last several years, we we have seen game companies making more investments in this space, in you know building teams and putting resources into this. One of the statistics that we 
uh, that I make, you know, we, we try to make sure is included every year because, you know, these are ultimately businesses, right? Every year, year over year, we've, we've seen an increase in the degree to which gamers are quitting playing certain games because of the harassment they experience in those spaces. And so, you know, if the game companies don't need a sort of a moral incentive to address hate and harassment, there's a business incentive in the sense that gamers are leaving games because they don't want to be in these spaces where they experience such sort of brutal and vicious hate and harassment. So I do think if the game industry wants to continue to see accelerated growth, if it wants to, I think you're going to see the ways in which online games protect their users, create safe and inclusive spaces, become a differentiator between how games operate as a, as sort of platforms or try to differentiate one another. So it's my hope that that's going to be a case. But in terms of what's coming down the uh, the pipe, I think you know the, what we see in the in the metaverse and in in the sort of turning of of Facebook towards a more game like environment is that online games and the ways in which they operate is going to be a sort of next frontier of content moderation. As you know, I think we saw it in sort of Clubhouse, Twitter Spaces, all these things, the ways in which certain affordances of games, the audio voice chat piece, became all of a sudden the the problem du jour when the game industry had been dealing with them for 10 plus years, right? So I think as we see social media companies pivot towards more game-like environments, the, the problems that the industry is facing will only be amplified and, and increase, I think, unfortunately. Well, on that note, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Sure. Thank you for having me. You've been listening to Arbiters of Truth, the Lawfare podcast series on our online information ecosystem. You can find past episodes in the Lawfare podcast feed, and we'll be back with another episode next Thursday. The Lawfare podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. Our audio engineer was Kara Schillen. Our producer is Jen Pacha Howell. Please rate and review the Lawfare podcast on whatever app you use, and consider becoming a material supporter of Lawfare on Patreon at patreon.com backslash lawfare. As always, thanks for listening.